Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Interconnect 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, IBM. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, our flagship program from SiliconANGLE Media. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. And we are here at the VIP uh, Go Social Lounge, interconnectgo.com is the website. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Brian Kramer, the CEO of Pure Matter, VIP influencer, author, uh, overall great guy, TED talk, uh, talker at the TED at IBM event, and uh, been in the biz entrepreneur, uh, great, great uh, person to know uh, and talk with. Thanks for coming to the Cube, Brian Kramer. Welcome to the Cube. Thanks for having me. I so, appreciate it. I'm so, looking forward to it. So the Cube was originally when we first started on talking the Cube was like where ideas can grow. So it's not so much a what's going on with IBM because of course IBM it's the air event stuff going on here. Yeah. But people are involved and um, IBM is really transforming themselves into social business. Yeah. And I remember in the '90s. They coined the term e-business, but no one talks about e-business anymore. Right. So IBM really is on the front end of a mega yeah, it trend. It's called cloud. It's called it's called the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's called now mobile, right? Cloud, mobile, and social. So again, like e-business, it's all native. E-business is electronic. That's the internet. Yep. Social business, they coined that. They're on the front wave of a killer trend, and you are a big part of that. You are part of their new way to work event. You're an author, so you're in the you're in the trenches. You're in the front lines. So what is this social business phenomenon out there and what does it mean to people, businesses, and potentially kind of the world? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question. So one of the interesting things that a lot of people are thinking about right now is what is, you know, they get social media. I mean, you get how to post a status on Facebook or a, a tweet out to a lot of different people. Um, you write what you think and you tweet it out. Um, the problem with that is you're pushing a message. You're sending something out and you're not actually engaging, which is what you're talking about. It's all about people. So social business takes that to the next level. It connects two people and engages in a conversation. And it puts everything as a touch point throughout the entire business. So it socializes every moment of truth that is possible. So think about like the shopping experience on any kind of online website or the, the experience of buying something with any product here at IBM. Every single touch point and every experience should be socialized. How do you make that an engaged experience? So that's really what social business is. It's not just pushing a tweet out, it's actually creating a shared experience where you can engage as a community. And this is, sounds, really easy to get your arms around, just it's like normal social interaction. It should be. It's like walking into a, a, a meeting or a, a cocktail party and networking, right? When you walk in and you share a drink with someone, you are engaging and networking. You might hand your business card over to someone and it becomes a, a, a networking event. That's no different than what social media should be. So Dave and I always talk, like we love Twitter, we use Twitter all the time, we have our analytics system, and we look at Twitter as people are talking publicly. So imagine actually recording everything. It's all recorded. So, right. so what, let's talk about the old way and new way, right? In that context, right? The old way was email marketing, website, which is great. In Gen one, you put a website up there, people can self-share themselves, use Google search, find out what you're looking for, right. make a decision, talk to your friends. Hey, should I buy that car? Should I do this? Should I go on that trip? Mm -hmm. Offline, right? Now you have clickstream information. I came to the store, walked around virtually, they all had metrics. That's all pretty much good, right? Now with this Twitter and social phenomenon, you have first party data, mm -hmm. whole new concept. That has nothing to do with like click streams. It's right. out in the open. Um, this teases out your human to human thing. What do you make sense of that concept of the first party data and how that could change reporting, interactions? Because it's now a new metric. I mean, right. I just got my Twitter, you know, I walk into a site, I'm, I'm in, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, it's all about what we do with the data. Um, and so, you know, if there's a if there's a billion and a half tweets happening every two days, then what what are we going to do with that? How are we going to listen yeah. to the data that's happening? 
what are we going to parse out that's going to make it easier for us to not automate, but actually, again, engage? So where are, the moment, where are those moments where you can create a customer-centric conversation or a potential customer-centric conversation? So people are talking about their experiences all over the place. So if we could take all of that data, that potential data, and use things like IBM Analytics and IBM's uh, partnership with Twitter to, and Watson to be able to combine those efforts and fi figure out where those moments are and then go have a human-to-human -human experience, that's what we're trying to do. So you said earlier, every touch point should be socialized. Can, can I poke at that a little bit and just to understand better what you mean by that? Yeah, so um, right now we're creating a co-created experience. I mean, this is broadcast, it's also being um, uh, uh, broadcast on, on speakers. We're creating this experience and then hopefully this then also becomes a shareable moment, a shareable experience that people want to learn from, that they want to share out, that they want maybe even want to tweet out. And so um, that becomes one touch point in the total IBM experience. You can take that all the way through the buying cycle. You can take that all the way through, um, you know, uh, think about it in terms of like an online shopping experience where somebody goes online and they purchase something, but they don't end up uh, or sorry, they, they shot for it, but they don't end up purchasing it yet. And so now all of a sudden they go and they have a different experience in another store, and then maybe they have another experience with, with a friend of theirs who actually says, hey, I've had a good experience with that product, you should go back and buy it. I think it's a really good product, whether it's a bike or something that you're really wanting to buy. And then eventually you go back and you actually buy that product. Now, first of all, there's no nothing linear about that buying process mm, right. like there used to be. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be you start in one place and you end in another. I mean, we only had advertising, uh, radio and TV, according to you know the Mad Men days. Those were the only two ways that you could advertise. Now you hear all these this bits and pieces of information all over the place. So nothing about it is linear. And yet, through the buying cycle, we're creating these little moments, these little moments of truth, these little shareable moments that are eventually leading us back to buying that same product because we trust the people that are in the us. moment is huge but, right but now. So, but so I want to I want to just understand the, the the sort of control points to that socialization. So if the premise is that every touch point should be socialized, I, I as a consumer I say, well wait a minute. I don't maybe not want every uh, touch point. So you're talking about the data being socialized of that experience or how, what's the control point there? I mean it's the obvious privacy anonymity like last night with the Z party. A lot of debauchery going on. I did not want to be in the video. For example, a lot of social business going on. No, it wasn't. It was good. It was all. You good can't edit it. You're out in the good open. clean mainframe fun. But so, so, so you, no, you're I, out in the open. You well, can't. I was, but I was sort of behind you when you were filming. But <laughs> <laughs> I chose. A, a I chose not to be in that video. But so, how do I choose as a consumer not to share that? Sometimes I don't want to share my purchase on Facebook. I mean, sure. Oh, right. So. Talk about the flip yeah. side of that coin. Um, so a, a shared experience is, it does not have to be a digital experience. It can be a shared experience between two people that's not being filmed, that's not being released on the internet. It's a shared experience that we're having that makes me want to go then buy that product. So that's why that's, it's not linear. Now, what are we doing as, 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 as brands to make that experience happen? How are we helping to create those shared experiences, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, and so this human to human piece, it's like Abhi Mehta says, um, the persona of one. I mean, he's, the guy comes out of the banking world, right? They can't, you can't be more impersonal than, than the banks. Um, but, but personas yeah. change though in real time based on what you're doing. It, so it, my reality, in, when I'm on the go, in the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing to the bank, for instance. I got a banking transaction. I'm on the corner. Of the, I'm, that in that moment, I have context. Right? And, and, so okay. But, so, but now we have the data. So what, one of the things I'll be said is that sampling's dead, right? And it's, it's completely transforming the way in which we should be thinking about it. I'm trying to tie it into this socialization of every every touch point because we have the data now. But the hard part, like you said, it sounds easy. But the hard part is okay. How do I package that right. and, and get it consumed? These pieces of confetti that are all over the place. Who's doing that well? Is IBM doing that well? What other brands are doing it well? Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, we're sitting in the land of uh, Vegas right now in, in, in one of the greatest places to actually be having this conversation. Casinos are doing that really well. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, they're, they're, they invented it. Uh, they're, they're buying in rewards cards that we use 
in the casino to go actually gamble. They're tracking every single movement across this casino, across our casino experience. You want to talk about shared experiences. They know when we come out of a concert what time that's going to be so that they can open up the bar across the way and have three bartenders ready for the amount of people that are coming out and create a shared experience exactly for those people because they know who went in based upon their cards that they're using. Their VIP cards got them in. They know who's coming out. They know based upon the past. They, now, this gets into a creepy versus cool conversation, but they know what kind of drinks we like. They could have those drinks ready for us and probably come close to nailing it. So we're actually sitting in the land of an answering yeah. that exact question. It's all question. about the data, though, really. It it's, really it's, is. And then, it, do you see the new badges for this event? Yeah, it's all RFID. It's, there's a lot of data on there. I'm not sure what it means, but um, just watch where you I'd, go. I'd like to see it's, what it's they like, know about me. It's like that me. movie, Enemy of State. You just got to Should I be your... able to? Should you be able to what? To see what they know about me. You. You well, yes. You should be able to see what they know about you. you they should be transparent well, about everything. Today, obviously, um, right. Yeah. The problem is, and, and the good thing is that they don't probably have an interest in specifically just you. Otherwise, they would have a much bigger army, a much bigger team of people yeah. that would have to focus in on every single person. So they're looking at trends. They're not looking at an individual. Right. Okay. Experience. But so, the, but the H to H. That's is, where I think is, they is need is to go. It's going deeper. That's persona of one. Right. right. That, that concept. Well, think about. It. I mean, the old days of, of the casino, you used to have a person you could go to. Yeah. Like you had a you had a a, a personal like uh, uh, um, uh, like pit boss or a personal yeah, like, the white glove service. Yeah, yeah, that would come out and they say, "What can I get you next? And how can I help you with you know your next drink? Or, yeah. or uh, do you want to go on a ride? You know, down the street, I'll, I'll get you a limo and we'll take care of everything for you. Right. You know, so so we've kind of gotten away from that. Yeah. We've kind of gotten into the point now where we're trying to automate so much. We're trying to use the data to you know create. Yeah. Less that you know, less. Do less you think than personalization. You, that's a great point? White glove service in the old day was physical, face to face interaction, yeah. engagement at the highest form. Okay, are we have too much noise right now? Automating is a good challenge. It's personalization, is you know, collective intelligence, all that great stuff, great computer science stuff. But are we over notified? And is that a work area? Do, do you believe that? And you've been in design. You've, you've been in this business for years, right? You've seen the cycles. This, are we over notified right now? Is there too much notification going on? Is yeah, there there's too much personalization. Absolutely, there's too much content. There's 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 a, there's so much content right now that where would you where do we turn for our answers? And and who's who's not putting who's putting out content that for actual for the, for a real reason like to to really educate the consumer to really put their efforts into something that's going to really continue a buying purchase. You know, it's going to help somebody. What, what, you know, as Jay Bear always talks about, what if you help the customer, they're going to yeah. want to come back and help you. And so, you know, instead of writing and creating all this content um, for content's sake, that's the problem. I mean, there's too much content out there, and we need to actually focus it's on it. It's not valuable. Quality. Marketing is a source of value, is yeah. really what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And well, the, the rules are changing too. Transparency is, when we talk about this about the open source game, right? Mm -hmm. Transparency now, which has always been an ethos of open source, doing it in the open. Right is now completely open because it's 100% measurable so you can't hide anywhere. Right. You can't. They, they know what you had for breakfast before you let had me, for Bria. Let, me, let me put it this way. I'll tell you like really quick short, I'll try to keep it short story. In, in call, in call, I had a, you guys had, had high school jobs and sure, college jobs. Yeah. Right? Stock and shoe shelf. And, <laughs> and how, how much fun were those? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, so, the lifeguard once, that was pretty good. I worked at the country club. It was, I had a great job. Anyway. So I had all kinds of jobs. I had like, and I, unfortunately in the last very long because I thought maybe uh, you know they weren't being entrepreneurial. They just wanted me to make a sandwich in the sandwich shop for 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, were... 30 second sandwich, you don't want one of those sandwiches. <laughs> so I eventually like made my way through to becoming a pizza driver. Um, I won't say the brand, but I was a pizza driver uh, in college. And I was constantly trying to figure out how to make more money, right? And uh, <laughs> Because I'm like a poor college student, so how do I make more money? Well, delivering pizza in college only gets you a dollar or two, if that. Sometimes no tips at all. So how do I how do I up the game? How do I deliver more value with this commodity? I mean, pizza is a commodity. It's it, you have one pizza. I mean, we could yeah. argue this to death for an hour, but pizza is no, pizza, yeah. right? So so I'm delivering these pizzas. I'm not making very much money. If one day I'm shopping in a grocery store and I see these uh, this this pallet of two liters, and I bought the the pallet. I bought the whole pallet because it was fifty cents for two, so uh, a quarter per two liter. Put it in the back of my 1954 Chevy Blazer. Blue, blue Chevy, I've missed that truck. So I put it in the back of that, that truck, drove it around, and with every medium or larger, I would deliver a, a two liter. And I'd hand it to them, and they would go, I didn't order that. And they'd say, yeah, I know, that's, that's from me. I'm just gonna give you this two liter. 
I swear to God, they would go, that's exactly what I needed right now. And they'd reach into their pocket and they'd come out with $5 or $10. And at the end of the night, I started making between two and $300, where before I'm making like 20 to 30 bucks. And the reason that happened is because I was providing unexpected value in a moment when they actually needed something like you just prove here. You just proved what I've been saying along. Entrepreneurs are born. Not, you can't <laughs> learn it. You can go to school for entrepreneurship, but you are born. Did you have a paper route? Did you pirate software? Did you arbitrage your pizza delivery? <laughs> you are an entrepreneur. You are, uh, that is entrepreneurial. But isn't story. that what we're all looking for? Yes. We're, we're looking for, un, uh, we're, we're looking for yeah. uh, pleasant surprises. We're looking yeah. for value yeah. in a moment when yeah. you didn't even know you needed it as a customer. Yeah. And that's what you can do on social media. That's what social business is about. <laughs> It's providing that unexpected value. Well, let's get back to the content thing, because this is a really great point. Value is in the eye of the beholder, is one of my phrases. It's in contextual, but if it's noisy, we're over-notified, people are meeting each other online. There's new value in this engagement. I just tweeted to someone's loved, it, loved your point, and your point about socialize every touch point. There's new currency out there. Engagement is also currency with people. Right, I mean, I love the story uh, with iSocial Fonds, Brian, and you guys are on Twitter, I love that connection. People meet each other, they build relationships online that never would have been there, right? So like, what's happening is, is that, like you did with the soda, an unexpected surprise, people can get content and develop content, yeah. play in the open. Talk about that new dynamic, This, because this plays into this whole earned media thing that we've been riffing on is, you don't have to buy content, you don't have to buy audience anymore. The audience is already out there. So to your point about the soda is really good, good yeah. point. Yeah, yes and no. Um, so social networks are making it now, that it is a pay to play. It's starting to get to the point, nothing lasts for free. Yeah, that's true. I mean, nothing's for free in this world. So they, eventually you pay for something, whether it's the time to create that content, which is, re, we are, that's resources and time. Yeah. So how much, and, and, and a lot of times we say it's free, but how much, how much are we hiring people to write the content, to build the content? I mean, this is, this is not free, but at the end of the day, we're putting it out there and we're offering it up for free. We're giving it to other people at the risk of them not returning uh, you know, something in return to give us their purchase, to right. give us their sale. So we're running that risk. But I also, I talk about this in my book about the give, 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 yeah. give, 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 and then you maybe get. And if you don't, keep giving. And that's that's really what this is all about. That's, a that's time what content premise, is though, about. Right? I mean, it really is. I mean, through the centuries, you can talk about you know examples of people giving with no expectation of something in return, but somehow it gets returned. Right. right? Yeah. It's it if really it's valuable. Is. Well, yeah, that's, it's the golden rule, right? Yeah. But, that's right. But let's take this to one to one step forward because transparency and time is money, right? So your attention, all that stuff we talk about. Open source. We always talk about developer, right? The ethos of open source is stand on the shoulders of giants before you, and mm -hmm. that ethos is give and take and a quid pro quo is. <laughs> you put yeah. source code in. Social media, in my mind, is taking that same kind of trajectory. We're offering stuff for free, yeah. but there's still a quid pro quo going on. Exchanges of information, uh, IBM's extracting value out of right. the freeness for the community. So do you see the community of an open source framework applying to social business on the human to human level? Is there some similarities there um, in terms of the protocol? Respect, uh, yeah. code? Um, I, I think, I think um, I understand your question. I think um, what's going to end up happening is we're going to end up developing micro niche communities. And I think where we're at right now is trying to figure out this global community, like yeah. how do I get in touch with all of these people? Yeah. But eventually it becomes like your neighborhood. We're going to need, we're, we want to get to know our neighbors. We want to get to, and our neighbors aren't, that aren't in, a, in a, a proximity. They're around the world, but our neighbors become a proximity of, of, of um, of keywords, a proximity of, of interests. So, you know, you've noticed that Facebook has started to buy individual networks. They've started to buy, you know, think companies like Instagram. And, and what they're buying is they're buying niche communities, they're buying micro communities. Now, these are large communities, they're paying billions of dollars. But they have affinities people. within them. But right. they have yeah. communities within mm -hmm. them, and maybe one day Facebook won't be as relevant as those communities are. Um, and that's where I think it's heading. I think we all need to actually, you know, invest in micro communities. And as IBM, and I think back to your question, where I think you're heading with that, is is yes, they, there is a community there. It needs to be developed, and that's yeah, where the, the future that, community. Is I just at. get worried. I mean, I love the community model. I think it works. I've seen it work personally, and I think it does work for social. Media. But people use it as a punch. Now, oh, community is a bumper sticker. It just puts community on it, and everything's great. Yeah, yeah. Let's, we're going to go out and build an ecosystem with communities. Yeah. Yeah. Where do I start? You know, green peace, you know? man. Yeah. We'll get a question from the crowd here so yeah. um, for, for you how much personalization is too much benefit 
or limit the user, question mark. It's certainly frustrating the hell out of me as a customer, sort of creepy, from Corrine Torres. Thanks for the question. Um, how much personalization is too much? Benefit or limit the user? It's frustrating. P uh, personalization is one of those things where when you sign up for something and you give over your information and you spell out exactly the things that you like, you basically you opted in and you have given over your information. If I said, if I told you I like the color green, I've opted in to you sending me green things and you should personalize me on that and I actually have opted into that. Now if I didn't provide you information and you're giving me personalization on certain things that you shouldn't, be because I have never given that to you. You took it from my credit card company or you bought it yeah. for something else Permission. and now all of a sudden you're personalizing to me. I've not given you that information. Now that's crossing a line that becomes personalized. That becomes creepy. And yeah, and out of context though, right? Because that's the whole point. It's out of context completely. Right. You said I like green over here. Now you're using green. It's retargeting you right. on some data from another context and you're getting green shoved yeah. in your face all day long on some banner ad. That's right. But it comes back to your perception of value too because if I'm lost and I need the help and Google helps me, I'm, I'm really thankful for that level of personalization, but if I'm right. getting spammed for well, this is some Jonah. product that I bought three weeks ago, yeah. I, I'm done, you know, and right. you so know what I mean. So Je well, Jeff Jonas, we've interviewed on theCUBE before, we've talked about this mostly in the security context, yeah. Um, it's all about puzzle, puzzle pieces. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's his like, mosaic, it's right. riff. I love his talks, dude. He's a, a great one to talk. Jeff Jonas is a great uh, interview to look yeah. at, but he's like all about the puzzle pieces. He goes, John, Dave, Terrorists don't write bomb on manifests, right? They don't say, I'm shipping a bomb. That, that's a metadata model, so like that's right. a keyword, right? You know, looking for bomb is the wrong approach for looking for bombs. Yeah. So don't look for the keyword bomb. Look for other <laughs> things. You know, it's so interesting. So this is personalization. Green is wrong, it's a wrong yeah. keyword. So now what, you have to really do the, the big data thing to get real personalization. You know, and it can also be wrong. Um, like for instance, years ago when this was new when email marketing was a new thing. Um, I was running a campaign for a really high-end resort uh, spa place and, and uh, I, I shipped the email out, um, our, our team shipped the email out. I was tracking all the, all yeah. the responses and who, what people were doing and um, my dad was on that list, which was ironic. I, or I think I put him on that list just to see if I could like figure it out, right? Have him be respond. Testing, I want right? to see I response see rates. Yeah, I want to see like what somebody I know. Guarantee like, at least one response rate from your dad. Guaranteed, <laughs> like, right? And, and he did, he clicked on it and he clicked over and then he, it stopped, he clicked into one page then he stopped, went off and then an hour later he went back on again and then he clicked all the way through and it was a Mother's Day campaign, um, but he ended up buying a, a day spa package, right? So I just emailed him on the side and I'm like, hey dad, I noticed it took you an hour to go back and actually purchase that and you bought it for her package for Valentine's Day. It is for mom, right? And, and he replied back and said, what the heck is going on here? How do you know that? Like, this is revolutionary stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, for him it's like, amazing. For him like, it's what, like, and, and it's stream, creepy. Yeah. Yeah, it but is that's creepy. what I'm talking about. Like, that's yeah. creepy stuff. So we have access to that kind of stuff. What we do with that information is up to us as marketers to yeah. really make sure that it's benefiting the customer, not benefiting us. Well, yeah. the laws are really fuzzy right now. Is there like going to be, remember pre-email marketing when there was no law against it, the guys who did the land grab, succeeded in the end. We're going to see a similar thing here with privacy. Absolutely. Well, there was no hand spam laws back in the day. Remember, right. Dave's land grab, and then that had yes. been enacted. And so many people built enormous databases in there. All right, so, so most people love email marketing. Even today, you still see webinars out there. It's a tried and true method. But again, if you want to put the line in the sand saying old way, new way, if we are in the new way of doing stuff as IBM's theme is, you got to put email marketing in the old way and right. webinars and, and other forms of you know, walled gardens and or web-based old techniques. Not everyone can be as aggressive being a forward thinker. So what, what is the transition? What is the new way ah. to do email marketing? What is the new way to do webinars? I mean, we have an opinion on that, but like yeah. these are the things that are people are looking for if it's human to human, if yeah. there's peer-to-peer, -peer, if there's some big data mojo that can be tapped into for the benefit of the user, there are got to be new ways. Yeah. So I, I think email marketing is still very relevant and it's not going to go away. I think the way that we use email uh, as we move forward in a corporate setting will change. So there's two different things. One is how do we reach out and, 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 and touch someone based upon their preferences, likes, and what do we say. So if I'm going to send something out to a mass audience and I'm going to think that I'm going to personalize it, that's never going to happen. Because I haven't taken the time to actually um, you know, uh, customize a message 
based on based upon their preferences and and groups without being creepy. But internally in the company, we've got millennials growing up that don't really like email. They like Snapchat. They like Instagram. They will private message you on Facebook. They will not use email. Not until they go and to college. So, my, son, they, my, well, son, my son, my son doesn't yeah, set Maybe even then. Um, <laughs> my son doesn't set up voicemail or do email. Like that, it's a pain in the ass. The, the, like there you said, go. The so college much, will force them to do it to get their grades, but that's it. <laughs> yeah, I have to Snapchat my daughter to, to, yeah, to get her to come down for wanted, dinner. Right. I actually like will take a picture of dinner and say this is what we're having. If I yell at her, she does, she ignores me. But yeah. if I Snapchat her, she'll come back down. So you know, we have to like we have to change our thinking in a corporate setting. Uh, moving forward, that's going to happen yeah. in the next five to ten years, and and think that's why IBM Verse is so smart yeah. because it's changed the conversation from being an email marketing system to a community-driven conversation. It's socialized email, which is great. That's that's going to be that's going to be a great game changer. Brian, thanks so much for coming on the cube. Great to uh, have you on. You're awesome, entrepreneur. Been thanks, in the man. business for a while. VIP influencer. It's understatement. Congratulations for all your success and uh, and, and social. You're doing great. And the book books hard to write a book. I don't know how you do it, but uh, <laughs> how many I, books have you written? I drink I drink a lot of wine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> While you're writing, I, all your creative yeah. ideas come. <laughs> yeah, in the brainstorming mode for sure. I, I have one book, uh, Human to Human, that came out a year ago, and then I've got another book coming out um, in the spring called Share Algae. All right, oh. Brian Kramer inside the cube. Uh, we'll be right back with our next guest after the short break. This is the cube. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. <laughs>